Thank you very much, uh, Jacek, for your uh, very friendly introduction. And uh, I think the applause is for you, because you are the founder or the creator of this uh, unbelievable, excellent uh, um, project, uh, indeed, to have this uh, kind of university, if you like, of college with chairs which are extremely important and uh, apparently still unique. So I would like to see, as I could write it down in the guest book, uh, some export of this idea around Europe because a chair about uh, European civilization is something apparently we need more than ever. And uh, it's uh, important to pass knowledge, information, experience to young people and that's why I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to give uh, this speech but uh, I hope having listened to you carefully uh, that here in the audience one or the other might become one of my successors uh, because then you could really rely to an <laughs> theoretical and academic uh, um, education uh, on this uh, field, which I don't have, so I'm learning on the job, and uh, you could combine both, and uh, maybe in some years, one or the other might indeed become, maybe not a commissioner, but working for the European Commission, for the European External Action Service, and uh, supporting us in our efforts uh, to create a better life, not only in Europe, but also in our neighborhood. People deserve it, particularly in our neighborhood, to take care about them and to cooperate with them. But that leads me immediately into the topic of uh, today's speech, and I'm once again grateful for this opportunity to give uh, the inaugural lecture for uh, this uh, academic year here in the College of Europe in Natalem. I'm especially pleased, and it was already mentioned by uh, Jacek, that uh, there are students from both uh, neighborhoods, so to say, not only from the east, but also from the south. As uh, future political and business leaders, your specialization in the wider neighborhood is uh, indeed needed now more than ever. We cannot have enough experienced people in this very difficult and sensitive issue. I'm also grateful for this invitation as it couldn't be timelier uh, as we are just putting the finishing touches to our neighborhood policy review which we will publish in mid of November. So this is a welcome opportunity for me to share some of our thinking. Dear colleagues, ambassadors, students, it's an open secret that the people who wrote the first ENP strategy were those who had just successfully negotiated the 2004 enlargement. The European Union had uh, plenty to be proud of and others like the US and China were taking us more seriously because of the reunification of Europe as it was seen at that time. So it was not very surprising that the European Union set out to replicate its success with those who were not candidates for membership. The idea was not to make the neighborhood a waiting room for accession, nor was it conversely designed to be a consolation prize for those who were not joining. It was deliberately built on a constructive ambiguity and meant to do the difficult job of using transformative power of Europe without explicitly offering the big prize membership. The idea was that Europe would lead by example and uh, through our insistence on political conditions and values, improved economic integration, financial support, and legal approximation, and our partners would gradually emulate us. To put it bluntly, 
they would gradually become more European. Or so we thought. That was the functionalistic logic behind our work reflecting the dynamics that the Union itself has followed since the 1950s. Ultimately, the European neighborhood policy was about everything but institutions, as the then President Brody said. It was also a very different moment from now, the reunification of Europe made all kinds of things seem possible. The Rose Revolution in Georgia in 2003, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, made it seem likely that further massive transformation was possible. The South looked uh, unlikely to embrace change, but it was decided to make the same offer to all our neighbors. The original offer was based on the idea that those who undertook greater reforms towards democracy, human rights, and rule of law would be rewarded with more access to Europe, more funding, but also easier access to visa and more trade liberalization. This more for more was uh, deeply ingrained. And over time, as some partners advanced and was we learned uh, along the way, through the crisis in Georgia in 2008 and the Arab Spring in 2011, our offer was uh, stepped up significantly to include visa-free regimes, deep and comprehensive uh, free trade areas, offering massive access to the EU market, the possibility to participate in EU programs, and much more. So we have achieved a lot. We have brought some neighbors closer but in the light of structural problems and turmoil in many parts of the neighborhood, we have to take a hard look at the policy and ask us uh, self-critically, is it working? Is it delivering? How can we do better? Because we have to do better in our own interest. Well, those who believed we would easily create a ring of friends now find themselves and uh, Jacek already uh, referred to it, uh, uh, to this uh, famous Johnny Cash song, uh, so that today somebody could say we are surrounded by a ring of fire. Of course, instability and turbulence in the neighborhood has different causes. We should not fall into the trap of uh, Eurosceptic masochism either. It's not that uh, the EU has failed. There is an aggressive Russian foreign policy that doesn't respect the sovereignty of our neighbors and uh, deliberately destabilizes them. There is the rise and perverse violence of Daesh, the aftermath of the Arab Spring, complicated by the involvement of outside influences. So the EU is not the only force at work in its own neighborhood, events have taught us that very clear. Even more fundamentally, we have uh, to make a reality check regarding the incredibly complex modernization challenge all our neighbors face. Because instability is as much the result of internal factors such as an inexistent rule of law, deeply rooted corruption, persistent economic underperformance, poor trading links between our partners, feeble administrations incapable of implementing reforms even when they have been adopted on paper. And in the East, the vested interests we call oligarchs. It's very hard for any country to prosper without these fundamentals. Talent and enterprise don't flourish, investment goes elsewhere. And it is very hard to make governance reforms stick in countries that uh, don't enjoy clear authority over all their territory. Nearly a year ago, we started consulting on the future of the European neighborhood policy. We were very frank. The first question in the consultation document asked if we should continue at all. Overwhelmingly, the answer, and I was not really surprised, has been yes. But we have to change. 
But before giving you a sneak preview of the reform of EMB that we will be publishing later in the year, let me say a few words about the most, uh, uh, so to say, urgent and hot topic of today and the, the next days, it's about migration. It's uh, indeed the defining challenge of the moment. There are 20 million, and we should be aware of that, 20 million refugees and internal displaced people in our neighborhood alone, out of around 60 million worldwide. So one third of all the refugees and internal, dis internal displaced people are a around Europe. And the 60 million, by the way, is the highest number of refugees we have ever seen in human history. Even after World War II, we didn't have so many refugees like in 2015. Our key objective is therefore to help stabilize and to keep the hope of refugees to return to their homes alive. Let me underline two uh, key principles. First, money is crucial, but it won't do the trick alone. We need to use all our policy tools to address the root causes. Hence, the importance of a smarter, more effective European neighborhood policy, which we will present in mid-November. Second, we must clearly distinguish between countries and not throw them into one pot. First, we have Syria and its immediate neighbors, Lebanon and Jordan. Then there is Turkey. And uh, if it comes to the current uh, very severe consequences, it's uh, about the Western Balkan countries. They are not a source but they are also transit victims, if you like, an enclave within the European Union. But now turning uh, to the reform of the ENP. The main changes to be proposed in the review will be first, greater differentiation with the individual partners. Second, a sharper focus on areas of interest to our citizens and a focus on stabilization. Third, more flexibility in how we operate and more ownership uh, of our neighbors. Let me say a few words on some of these uh, building blocks. First, we have to differentiate. The idea that our power of attraction would eventually seduce all our neighbors has been proved inaccurate. We were too optimistic on that. Yes, we do have political pull. In more romantic terms, our union is attractive, and if we can see it today, it's more than attractive. Everybody wants to come to, to Europe. None of our neighbors wants not to have a relationship with us. They simply couldn't afford it politically and economically. But those who really want the deep integration opportunities and offer are in the minority. And even those who want to take the EU as some kind of benchmark for the reforms are only around half of our neighbors. Therefore, greater differentiation will require different styles of partnership with different neighbors, not the one-size-fits-all approach of the past. Those who want to seek deeper integration will continue to do so. Others who want a more transactional partnership will get a narrower menu based on agreed ideas and shared interests. This means we have to be smarter in using our toolbox. We have become too mechanical in our more for more policy. Frankly, the idea that we could automatically incentivize change with the carrots available has turned out to be false. Some say that our carrots are perhaps not big enough. Although these carrots are rather substantial, 50 billion euro of neighborhood funding from 2014 to 2020 
which is the multi-annual financial framework of the European Union. Access to the world's largest market, political support, etc., etc. More fundamentally so, I believe you can, cannot simply buy reform. You cannot turn on the light of modernization with the flick of a switch. You cannot install the rule of law by adopting the EU key on paper. We can only support reformers where they themselves choose that path. We are not teaching our values, but I want them to pursue more intelligently. By playing to the needs and ambitions of partners, we will actually get more leverage and transaction to help them take root, not less. So the new EMP will actually help us to be more effective in promoting our values. There will be less naming and shaming, <clears throat> less megaphone diplomacy, and more support to civil society. <clears throat> Next, we need more focus. Catch all action plans for reforms for all partners, ranging from agriculture to environmental rules, where often an excuse for inaction and for not deliver. Therefore, the new EMP will focus on a limited number of priorities reflecting the EU's interest. Also, this is something we have to stress more today than in the past. It's also about our interests. Of course, we have to respect the interests of our partners, but we have to see what is the common denominator and how we can match it. Because in the past the policy was always, or may I say, mainly focused uh, more on driving a reform agenda with our partners. Now it needs to promote once again more explicitly also our EU interests, like migration, energy security, counterterrorism and climate policy, as well as uh, human rights, uh, economic uh, development and judicial reform. It only succeeds if we pick our priorities wisely with a shorter to-do list with each partner. In particular, I want a focus on stabilization. We often took uh, basic stability for granted and focused uh, too much on advanced action. This means prioritizing economic <laughs> development. Employment and employability are key to tackling many of our challenges, including migration and radicalization. I really want the Union to think out of the box here. We should consider faster, lighter free trade agreements and trade measures to realize quick commercial wins for our citizens. Growth missions with European investors to harness the potential of the private sector, more seed funding for SMEs, more student and youth exchanges, including on vocational training, to invest in future generations and look into new avenues of legal circular migration, to name just a few ideas. There will be a strong new component of security and conflict sensitivity which would concentrate on the areas of security sector reform, counterterrorism, cooperation on CSTP matters, organized crime and border management, etc. Finally, a word on ownership. We need to act in the neighborhood in real partnership with more buy-in from the partners themselves, more coordination with the EU member states and a closer working relationship with the international financial institutions. So I'm happy to announce already that uh, we will be able uh, to have a cooperation on a contractual basis with the main international financial institutions, IMF, Monetary Fund, World Bank, EIB, EBRD, uh, because these four international financial institutions together with the European Union 
are in many of our neighboring countries the main financial investors, donors, however you might call it, and therefore it's so important to coordinate, so to say, our approach, our conditions, you can call it also incentives, towards a certain country in order not to arrive with different lists of conditions and so on, and to give the other side an excuse not to deliver. So if we are able to coordinate our efforts, our conditions, we are also helping our partners to deliver, to implement, and not uh, to try to escape. But nevertheless, we need to be more flexible in our funding to respond to ever-changing conditions. And we will make the annual reporting lighter, less judgmental, and more geared to planning cooperation in the year ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, the European Union cannot do this uh, alone. We can only succeed together. Let me therefore make a special appeal to those students among you who are from our neighbors. You are the ones who can make this happen in your countries, but may be together with your friends as we just uh, see it in Ukraine, where for the first time, like in successful soccer teams, people have been, may I say it a little bit sloppy, hired to join the government, also they are citizens from other countries. Uh, it's a very interesting experiment, and we will say what is the outcome, but it's funny to see and to hear that in the Ukraine government, as the finance minister is um, an American with, of course, Ukrainian roots, if things become complicated, the government is talking in English. Uh, and not in Ukrainian, in order to guarantee that everybody understands what's going on. So I think quite an interesting development, but once again, to be serious, uh, you, you receive an excellent education, you gain a fantastic network, a network of friends for the rest of your life, and therefore, after having heard a lot about uh, European neighborhood policy, I think it's important to move from theorizing the ENP to realizing the ENP. But you have the best uh, preconditions to do that. So that's why I wish you all an excellent, fruitful, and inspiring academic year. Thank you very much.